Hey Dev Team, welcome back to Flutter with Droig. What I want to do in this episode is get the back end of our payment processing system working to some extent. And to do that, there's a number of steps involved. Um, but first, I have to admit I have upgraded my version of Flutter recently. to Flutter 3.0 and as a result the app doesn't compile straight away anymore so there's one little change we need to do and that is in pubspec.yaml Flutter Stripe 2.5.0 doesn't work with 3 version 3 of Flutter it's a quick fix we just need to change that to 3.0.0 save that get the packages and once we've got the packages installed uh, we'll do a compile so let's just do that and get ourselves running again so fabulous now we're up and running we're coming back to our server and our controllers and stripe and within our payment sheet we're setting up an intent to purchase something but we don't actually list what it is we're purchasing we need to save that information so here i'm going to create a new variable called items and this is going to be, I'm going to set it as a type, an array of anything. And we'll set it up to a blank to start with. Then, as we loop through each of the items, providing there are no errors, we're going to save that item to the items array. So items, push, item. OK, so we're, we're saving that in. Then we come through, we set up our users, we do all sorts of stuff there. And then before we return, we want to save this information to our database. So DB collection, and I'm going to call this collection orders. And we're going to put it in a document. And we need to specify a document ID, or if this will just give us a random one. And the document ID is going to be the payment intent ID that has been created by Stripe because that's we can then use later on. So we've got this payment intent. So let's just take the payment intent ID and set our data. OK, so our data is going to be a few things. We're going to store the UID of the user. We're going to store the list of items and we're going to store a status which is going to be unpaid because at this point we're only setting up the payment intent. It hasn't actually been paid yet. So just a reminder that where we have UID like this, that is the same as doing that. Uh, it's just that if the variable name is the same as the key name, then you don't need to put both in. OK, so let's save that. Let's run our server. Making sure, of course, you're in the server directory. We'll give that a second to recompile. And then we're going to come to our event that we can book. I'm going to also add a T-shirt. In fact, I've added two T-shirts because that's how we set that button. Let's try and check out. OK, now in between episodes, I also deleted the user from the Stripe. So this is a brand new user, which is why it hasn't got my card saved. So let's save that. And we know that this should go through. Let's do that payment. OK, that all went through. And that's all we need to do with the app. So I'm going to close down the emulator. We don't need that anymore. Let's come to our Stripe customer, do a refresh. And there we are, our test user with a, a set of events that has just happened. Okay, 
So that's where we were before. But hopefully now, if we come to our Firebase console and refresh this, because it's a new collection, so it won't appear automatically, we have our orders collection, and we can see that we have an order collection with a payment intent ID of this. We can see the items and the quantities. So we've bought one event, one, and two t-shirts, one. The status is unpaid, and the user ID is our user ID. Excellent. So the rest of the stuff we need to do now is server-based. We also need to install Stripe CLI tools for the next part. And you can do that by Googling their documents, finding Stripe CLI, and you're going to need to install the Stripe CLI. The instructions are here. And if you get to this part, login, we'll do the login bit in a second, but you'll need to install for your operating system, the Stripe CLI. So go ahead and do that and we will carry on. Okay, so I've gone ahead and I've got the Stripe CLI installed. Um, now I'm going to need a number of terminals down here and it's going to get confusing. So in VS Code, I'm just going to rename some of my terminals by right clicking on the name and going to rename. I'm going to call this one the server because that's what it is. So we need a new window. Now I installed the CLI in D Stripe Stripe. And to get started, the first thing we need to do is simply log in. When you do that, you'll get a set of pairing codes, useful magic R door wound, that'll be unique to you, and a link which you need to go to. Let's do it. Okay, so this is, I'm already logged into Stripe, as you saw. We just need to now check that our um, pairing code is the same as on our PC or on our computer and click allow access. And that has now set us up. Our Stripe CLI is configured and we're good to go. So let's come back to our business customer here and you can see that we have an event for this customer saying the payment for £106 has succeeded. If we click on that we can see the event data for that event and we also have the event ID which we're going to be using after. But for pretty much every event within Stripe they can send that to our web server for us should we want. However, we don't currently have a live web server. We only have our local web server running. But the CLI tool can act as a web server for us and pass the events to our web server. Wow. So how do we set that up? Okay. Let's come to, first of all, our index in our server. And we're going to need to set up a new route. But this route needs to happen before any of this is taken care of. Uh, we can't do any authentication because Stripe isn't authenticated for us. It has its own authentication method. So above all of that, we're going to put in an app post because this is a post request that we're going to call webhook, but we can call it, you can call that whatever you want. And we're going to pass it to a function, which I'm going to do in another file, but I'm going to call it Stripe webhook. Okay, let's create that file. So in our server, I'm going to right click new file, Stripe webhook.ts and let's get coding this. So we're going to export a function called stripe web hook. That's going to have a request which is going to be a stripe request. Sorry, it's going to be an express request and a response which is going to be an express response. 
like so and we'll do that so immediately in this function all we're going to do is do console log we have a call and then we have a call and then we will return our response with a status code of 200 to say everything is all right it's not status code it's send status okay coming back to our index we can then import that from our stripe webhook and if we come to our server just make sure we've got no errors so we'll save that and that's running with no errors now in our powershell what we need to do is set up our stripe to listen to those requests and we can do that with our stripe command but not login we're going to listen which is listening to events and then we're going to forward those events to localhost port 3000 which is what we're using for our local host if you remember um, in our index which we haven't got open and we have got it open yeah sorry there it is 3000 and to the endpoint webhook okay so if i hit enter there that will set it up and it will give us a secret webhook signing key which we need so i'm going to copy that and now if you remember we set up some environment variables for our server and you need to set up this signing key in here as well so signing secret equals and then paste your key in now i'm doing this in my example one uh, if you just give me a second i'm going to copy and paste that into my secret env one which i've done okay so this is that key there and when we go live we'll get a we'll get another one from stripe which we'll need to replace it with okay so we have that super secret key in and i'm not keeping this as you can see super secret i'm sharing it with you guys but that's because you can't post to my local computer um, so it doesn't really matter in this particular case um, let's come to our stripe webhook then i'm going to rename this one to uh, the listener and i'm going to create another terminal in this terminal i'm going to stripe stripe and this one i'm going to trigger a payment intent succeeded and this is going to trigger just a fake succeeded um, thing but with the right format and what we should see hopefully is we have a call appearing in our server log uh, in fact so we can see it at the same time i'm going to copy that i'm going to come to our server and create a terminal next to it where well, i'm going to paste that in so let's do that We'll give it a second and there we are we actually have three calls happening but if we come to our listener we can see that to set up this um, payment intent succeeded we're going to get an event that sets it up an event to say it succeeded and that also triggers a charge succeeded event So those are the three events that our server has just received okay now we don't coming back to here we don't need this the whole time i'm going to close that second one down but i'm going to come to my stripe account again and copy this event id and in this instead of triggering the payment i'm going to say events resend and paste that id in and when i hit enter there 
the same event is now sent to our listener. There it is. And we can send that event over and over again until we have our code working. And that's the way we're going to test this out. OK. So we've got our event coming to here. Now, what we need to do is process that. So let's start our code. So let event, which is going to be of a type stripe event, we need to get some information and we need the secret key that we had previously. Uh, so that's our process env stripe secret key. We're going to need that uh, and we'll get that as a string. We're going to need the signature, which is the one we just saved. Uh, so I'll call that signature equals process env stripe signing secret again as string i'm doing it as string because these might return null and if we if we cast it as a string it's going to return a blank string for us okay hopefully those are right so then we set up our stripe communication if you like so we'll set up a new stripe and to do that we have to give it our key and the api version which is that and typescript which is true because we're using typescript okay we also need to get our signed headers so that when Stripe posts to this webhook for us, it will sign the event, which is how we check whether it's a valid event or not, or you know, someone just posting to our event. Uh, and so we need to get those signatures out of the header. So signed header equals request headers, and Stripe put it in a header called Stripe signature and if there isn't that we're just going to have blank okay next we try and construct the event so we get the event and that's going to come from stripe webhooks construct event and that's going to take in the request body that's been posted the signed header and our signature. Those are the three bits of information. And this will attempt to match our signature, check our signature and or take the body. It signs it with our signature and checks it matches the header and all sorts of stuff. And if that works, then we know that it's a secure message that has come from Stripe. If the message has been tampered with in any way, that will fail and so we need to make sure that if that fails we put this in a try catch and we'll catch that error and we will console log and we'll console log web hook sign signature error something like that and we'll make sure that we stop our processing at this point because we have no proof that this is a correct thing. So we'll send a message of 400, something went wrong, this isn't right. If we get to this point, we have the event. So let's console the log, the event, to see what we've got. Now, this isn't going to work immediately. And the reason is, is this body needs to be processed. It needs to be a specific type. It needs to be what's called a raw body and to get that it is very much like we did here where we put everything through our json but instead we need to put this through another set of middleware and it's a set of middleware called express raw 
and that will strip out anything other than the type we specify, which is going to be application JSON, because that's how they send it to us. Okay, so if the body is not application JSON, it's going to be end up being blank. If it is a JSON application, application JSON, then it will come through. And that should work. So I've saved that, we've recompiled it. Let's come back to our well, let, let's trigger our event again. Let's come here, resend our event, come back to our server. And there we go. We can see now that we have an event object that has come through on our server. And that is all good. Right. So we know now at this point that we have the event coming through. So let's get the data from it and cast it so we can easily use it. So once data, which is going to be of type stripe event data equals the event data and const event type, which is going to be a type of string that is going to equal the event dot type. Now, as you saw before, when we did a test, we got a number of different uh, events back. We're only interested in one. So we're going to say if the event type is payment intent succeeded, then we're going to do something. Otherwise, we're going to return OK because we're, we're ignoring the event basically, but we're acknowledging to Stripe that we've got it. If something happened and our server was failing or we were giving error messages back, Stripe would continue to resend this event over a period of time until we said, yes, we've received it. So this 200 isn't saying, yes, we've received it and processed it and everything's OK. This is just saying, yes, we've received your message. You can stop sending us this one anymore. OK, so if our event succeeded, let's get the event out of it. So this is going to be type stripe payment intent. And that's going to equal the data object. And we're going to cast it as a stripe payment intent because that's what it is. And that will give us then the ability to access all the different bits of information on it, yeah, which is all this information that has been supplied to us by Stripe. So we're going to take our DB collection, our orders collection, we're going to take a document and the document is going to be the payment intent ID and we're going to update it and we're going to update the status to paid and that's all we need to do we could process more here but actually we shouldn't this should be as fast as it could can so we're just going to be as quickly as we can and say that we've updated it so let's save that. Let's come over to our Firestore console where we have that payment intent. And if I have that on the screen and we resend the event again, with a bit of luck, it changes to paid. And that can only happen when we had a valid payment message from Stripe to say that that payment intent has been paid. OK. That's all we need to do with Stripe. So well, how do we do the final part then of actually doing something with that data? Well, we're going to turn here to something called Firebase Functions, which is something we've not touched on yet. 
and we're going to monitor this database and we're going to see that when this status becomes paid we're then going to do something with it but this is outside you know this happens outside of the stripe now to do this you do need to upgrade your firestore or your firebase plan which was on free previously to the blaze plan which is pay as you go now to do that um, you will need to if you come to this to modify and, and you choose the blaze pan plan you'll need to put in some billing information and what have you there won't be the for what we're doing there won't be any charges for this uh, but they still need your payment details on file now don't worry too much about this i'll talk about that in a minute and how to do that um, it is straightforward and it will actually step you through it when you try to store the functions on on firebase it will tell you that you need to upgrade the blaze plan and give you the links and everything to do that once that's done what we can do is is carry on so we're going to come here to our directory i'm going to type in firebase init functions because this is something new and we haven't initialized those yet Are you ready to proceed? Yes. Okay. What language are we going to be using? We're going to be using TypeScript. Do you want to use ESLint? Uh, really, we should, but I'm going to click no because it gets very fussy with spaces and all sorts of things. I'm just going to click no for now. Do you want to install the dependencies? Yes. Give that a second. With that done, I'm going to close down all the files, don't need any of those, and come to a new folder that's been created called functions. Uh, oop, missed source index. And they've got a test for demo function, I'm just going to delete that. We're also going to need to import star as admin from Firebase admin and admin dot initialize app which is something you need to do whenever we're using the firebase admin now if you remember when it came to our server we had to do all sorts of configuration here with various keys and things we don't need to do that with firebase functions it does all of that for us so we're not having to worry about it but we are going to need access to our database. So I'm going to set that up here. That's going to eat or admin Firestore like that. OK, so what are Firebase functions? Well, they are functions that can run on demand uh, within the cloud. But one of the things it can do is watch our database for us and watch for changes in the database. And that's what we're going to be using this for right now. So we're going to export a new function, which I'm going to call process payment items, something like that. And that's going to be functions firestore. And from here, we can give it a document. And the document is going to be the orders slash order ID. OK, so if you think about our document in the Firestore, it's in the collection called orders and it has an order ID. It doesn't matter what you put in those curly brackets. That's just so we can use it later. In fact, we're not going to need to use it later, but we could do if we wanted to. OK, and what we're looking for is we've got an on create, which is when when it's first created on delete. On write, so that's basically whenever there's any change to it, when every write or update, uh, and on update, which only happens when it's updated, not when it's created. That will give us a change and a context, and then we can do something with that. Okay. 
So the change contains both the old data and the new data. And I want them both out. So I'm going to get the new data equals the change after data and the old data is going to equal the change before data. So this is the data that's in the database, what it was before the change and what it is after the change. And we need that because we're going to say if the new data status equals paid and the old data status equals unpaid, make sure we spell this right, then we're going to do something. Otherwise, we're not going to do anything else because we only want this function to do something if we're going between unpaid and paid. So in the future, which is not something we're going to be doing in this in this set of series, but you could also do something like if the status becomes cancelled, you could process it, you know, do something else. But for now, we're only worried about going from unpaid to paid. OK, if we are in that state, then we need to get the items. The items, I'm going to make this easy by casting it here, well, not casting it, but specifying the type. It's going to be a list of code, which is a string, and a quantity, which is a number. And that is going to equal the new data items. In fact, we could get that out of the new data or the old data. It doesn't really matter because that's not changing. We also want to get the user ID out of the database. And again, that could come out of either. It's not changing, but we'll stick with the new data. I suppose that's better practice. So we've got the user ID and the items. Then we need to process the items. So items for each. So for each item in our items list, because don't forget those items is, is a list, is, it's an array of items, we're going to do something. Well, we've got two types of items. We've got events and we've got products and we need to handle them differently. Now, I'm not going to be handling the products here, but you could do it in exactly the same sort of way. Uh, but what we're going to say is if, all right, in fact, we need to get the code. Yeah. So const code equals item code. OK, so we get the code and we're going to say if the code starts with event, then we're going to do something. So we could then later on put if code starts with gift, do something else. And the sort of thing you do there is hand that off to the merchandising team, whatever, process that however you want. What we want to do is we want to set our user up so that we have it has a list of the events they've paid for within their profile so that we can handle that on the website later. So to do that, we're going to say DB collection. It's going to be the users collection. The document is going to be the user ID. And we're going to update that document. And we're going to update that document with a field called paid events. Now that may or may not exist, but it's going to be an array of all the codes of the events that the user has paid for. How do we do that? Well, Firestore has a function in there that does this for us, thankfully. Uh, so we're going to go Firestore field value array union and pass the code and that's all we need to do uh, if we didn't have oops that didn't go there if we didn't have this if they hadn't provided this 
what we would have to do is we'd have to get the, the collector or get the document from the user, get the events, add the uh, new event to the list of the existing events and put it back. Well, because that's something that's done commonly within Firebase, they've provided this function for us that will do it. And that's it. Let's save that and, and hopefully not made any mistakes. So I'm going to come over to our Firebase console because this now says paid because we updated it. I'm going to send that back to unpaid because don't forget this only works going between unpaid and paid. And then within our conference, I'm going to say Firebase deploy only functions and that will compile that function and send it to Firebase for us unless there's any error messages. Now it is, it's at this point you'll get an error message saying that you're on the free plan and you need to be on the Blaze plan and it will give you a link to do that and help you set it up. Uh, it is very straightforward. I'm already set up onto the Blaze plan which is the pay as you go plan. So we can see that the function folder is being updated and uploaded. It'll take a few moments. I'll come back. OK, and it's just finishing up now. It does take a little while, especially the first time. But you can see that our process payment items has successfully been created. If we come to Firebase and now come to our functions, with a bit of luck, you'll see that we have that function and it's listed there and it's listening to the orders order ID. OK, so let's come to our Firestore database, look at our users, and it's this user, the YDD. So we've got no paid for events in there at the moment. Let's come to our orders and change this to paid. And of course, don't forget this would happen with Stripe in the back end. Let's update that, come back to our users. And with a bit of luck, it always takes a few seconds the first time it does it. But with a bit of luck, we will see. There we go. Our paid events come in. Now, the reason it took a while is because essentially a server gets booted up or, you know, with our function on it. If this happened time and time again, it would be a lot quicker. So, for example, if I was to delete this paid event now, come back to our event, oh, sorry, our orders. I have to change that again to unpaid because don't forget it only triggers between paid and unpaid. But if we do that again now, you'll see that it's a lot quicker. It's already there. Uh, so yeah, if, if the server basically shuts down after a period of time without people using it. So if you have a if you have a popular app or not, you know that's being used frequently, then users won't really notice any delay uh, at all. And that's it. We've now got this process totally in place to handle the events. So let's test it from the very beginning. Let's delete that. Let's come to our orders and it doesn't really matter if we delete that or not. I'm going to leave it there, in fact. Um, and we should be able to come back to our app and give it a go. So just give me a second while I boot the app back up. OK, so we have our emulator backup. We have our Firebase collection visible here and we have our listener visible. Let's go to our starting with Flutter event book this event, go to our checkout, let's get a baseball cap as well, and let's check out. And we'll use the card that we've previously saved, and let's see how quick it takes to appear within our collection as a paid event. So, pay. There it goes. So even before the app screen has refreshed and dealt with, the paid event had appeared within our user collection. So that's working. Fantastic. Folks, we're going to leave it there. We'll deal with the next part next time. Hope you've enjoyed. If you have, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. It does help me out and we'll see you next time.
Take care now. Bye.